Have you ever been alone? Got nowhere to call your home? Have you ever lived in fear? Well, my friend, you're welcome here. You are welcome to my tears, my friend. You are welcome to my fears, my friend. Hank Wangford's the guy who who uh, who steps out on stage, who the people have paid money to see, and sings and writes those songs. And Sam Hart is a is a doctor who lives in London, and was you know a bit of a name on the scene in the sixties. Was Lig and the slithy toads did gyre and gimble in the wave or mimsy were the borogroves and the momoraths out grey. Boeing Duveen was a character I created in 68. And because I'd been mates with the Pink Floyd, uh, there'd always been talk that I was going to do a Pink Floyd song because uh, I was getting to the point where I was uh, going to do a single. In the end, I didn't do uh, one of Sid, Sid Barrett's songs, which is, had been the intention, but did um, a cover that I'd done of a Lewis Carroll poem. It was a great record, but people couldn't handle Boeing Devine and the Ministry of... Was it the Ministry the of... The Beautiful Soup. And the Beautiful Soup. I think. Boeing Devine and the yeah, Beautiful yeah. Soup. Yeah, the Jabberwock. And, you know, it was, in a way, it was sort of classic sort of hippie shit, wasn't it? Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the jaws, the bite, the claws, the cat. Beware the chop, chop, bird and shot, the freebies, band, the snatch. really of its time. The amazing thing is between Boeing Duveen and an empty bottle of broken heart and you're still on my mind, between Boeing Duveen and psychode high psychedelia and country music was 18 months. Here I go again Slipping whiskey in my beer For it ain't no use just hang around her here Since it slipped away Things just ain't never been the same Leaves me foolishly getting drunk Waiting for a train When I qualified as a doctor and I did my two house jobs I then found myself being a doctor and not knowing what I was going to do because I didn't really want to be a doctor, and I didn't like doctors, and I hadn't previously liked medical students. Then I discovered a friend who had a practice on Labrick Grove, uh, prescribing cannabis and looking after junkies, people coming off heroin. And I joined that, and for a year, that was a hippie practice, a hippie clinic. And it was great, and it was really exciting, because it was part of you know, the freaks and the alternative society. And that was all very political at that time. Uh, and then when that got closed by the police, uh, because they didn't like it, it was a thorn in their flesh. You know, junkies being treated like human beings was not the way they did it. Uh, I then moved down to uh, Exhibition Road to South Kent, and I started to work on my own. And because I wasn't on the national health, uh, I had to become a private doctor. And because I'd been prescribing cannabis in the hippie clinic, I, by that time, had a clientele of people, a lot of whom worked in rock and roll, you know, from big bands like the Rolling Stones, like uh, The Who, like The Grateful Dead, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Lots of that. That had a lifespan of about 18 months. Uh, and then I, it got too sycophantic for me, and I, I left and went off to Canada. And, and worked as a doctor in the middle of the prairies just to get away from that. But the great thing is during being a rock and roll doctor, uh, I met Graham Parsons because that personally was the thing which actually completely changed my life and put me on a different trajectory. Because all the time I was being a rock and roll doctor, all the time I was being a medical student, all the time, all my life, I've always played music. 
And it's always been important to me. So I was kind of juggling that. What do I do? How do I do this? How do I do that? So meeting Graham was great because it focused me onto country music, which previously I had disrespected hugely. And then I loved it. And then relocating, leaving uh, the, the kind of flesh pots of London and being a rock and roll doctor and all that adulation and Dr. Sam and all that, and going to the prairies, uh, I suddenly found myself in country western land, you know, in a little town of 700 in the middle of nowhere where the only radio is Radio Des Moines, Iowa, and it's wall-to-wall -wall country music, and every Saturday night I'm playing with a Norwegian or a, a Ukrainian country band at a wedding, you know. It just did the whole thing. So I'd had Graham in London, and then suddenly, bang, I'm living the dream. Now I got religion, pretty late in life. About the time I broke up with my third ex-wife. Friend was a bottle, life was a lie. And I couldn't believe in that pie in the sky. Or a big G, I couldn't believe. They told me he's better than a smoke or a cup of tea. Just, huh. He's the one, the one to set you free. Big G, Big G. Oh. My girlfriend comes over to America, finds that I still don't want to have kids goes back so that when I come back to England a couple of weeks later, I find she's got married to my ex-flatmate. Oh! What do you do in that situation? You feel very sorry for yourself. You think the world is against you. You think those bastards have done it to me. Whereas the truth is, I said to her, I didn't want to have kids. I did it to myself. But you'll never admit that to yourself when you're deep in the heart of whatever the problem is. It's always, it's the world, it's them, it's... Uh, yeah. So I'm sitting in Wangford, because by this time I've moved up to Suffolk. And Wangford is a little village, not far from where I was living. I'm sitting in uh, the White Lion in Wangford with a pint, and suddenly think, Hank Wangford, what a great name for the ultimate wanker. What a great name for somebody who thinks the world is ganging up against him, who thinks that the world has contrived to make him really miserable. <laughs> I'm jogging with Jesus. Jogging with Jesus. Jogging with Jesus. Jogging with Jesus, let Satan go skating, his sin spinning way. Ah, Kryptonic wheels. Bum, 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 bum. Jogging with Jesus, jogging with Jesus, jogging with Jesus, our lives on my way. Jogging with Jesus, jogging with Jesus, let Satan go skating this insane way. He's kind of always been off to the side of whenever anybody talks about really good British country music because he, he went for the funny angle. A humorous angle. I think he's always been considered. It's it's this kind of fight all the time against realizing that, you know, while with he's not taking himself too seriously, he takes the music very seriously. You know. When I started playing country music, I was mocking the attitudes in country music rather than the music. Why was I mocking? Because it's by my nature to laugh at things. It's in my nature to laugh at myself. It's in my nature to not take myself seriously. Uh, and that really works, giving myself a name like Hank Wankford, it's going to be very difficult to take myself seriously with a name as silly as that. And that's good. That's a good kind of safety valve. Because you know, I can't be getting on with people who take themselves seriously. It just makes me laugh. So I like things presented funnily. When I work as a doctor in a clinic, I'll do the same. 
I want to get in there. I don't want the people to be laughing. Or I see see a, a patient. I might you know not make crack jokes, but present it in a funny way because I know that when people laugh, their defences go down. So that if I want to play you, and I know you don't like country music, in fact, I know you really dislike country music, if I make you laugh, hey, I can put some country music in there and I know you're going to say, oh, I quite enjoyed that. I think it's inherent to who he is. You know, he, when you remember that he, he started out at, in the footlights at Cambridge and was the understudy to one of... Um, beyond the fringe and all that stuff, uh, you understand it better because then you see him in that, in the context of that tradition, which is where he comes from. He happens to be a fantastically good songwriter as well and can write good straight songs. He's just from the same tradition as Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller and all those people. He's, he's you know, one of that type of intellectual, slightly wacky left field uh, British eccentrics who happens to write great songs. I think you use humour, whether it's absurdist or not, to be liked. And we all want to be liked. And when you're a skinny bloke in the 50s and you're not being able to pull because of the size of your biceps, and you're a son of communist parents, so you're liable to be beaten up at any time, which I was regularly beaten up in the playground for being a commie. Um, you used humour to get out of being beaten up. You used humour to get into being liked because you were essentially not liked. You weren't likeable. And that's not good for a kid. Hank's early years are, 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 are odd to me. I, mean, I heard that he was born in a fascist stately home, which is pretty odd for a, you know, a lad who was born of very serious communist parents with a picture of Joseph Stalin over the mantelpiece. If you looked at pictures of Uncle Joe, he had a great image and he looked really kindly. He looked avuncular. The moustache was good, the little smile playing at the corner of his lips was good. You knew you could trust Uncle Joe. And he was truly my uncle, you know, in my heart. Uh, and there was a picture of Uncle Joe down there in the kitchen on the wall. You might have had the Pope, I had Uncle Joe. There's no doubt that, that he had an extraordinary upbringing. I mean, his parents uh, were distinctly unusual and um, their personal life was a strange one. And uh, how Hank uh, emerged as unscathed as he has, uh, I think is to his credit. I, I mean, I don't think he is unscathed. The, the stories he told about his parents splitting up, you know, the invasion of Hungary split his parents up. You know, one was pro Stalin, one said no, you know. But I kind of find it very odd, I can't understand that. When my mum um, had my younger brother as a result of having an affair with one of my dad's colleagues on the Daily Worker, the, the, the party stepped in and told them, you can't get divorced, my mum and dad. So for five years, my younger brother was raised as my younger brother, without any acknowledgement that he was actually somebody else's son until Hungary came along, the whole thing blew up uh, and the family was unable to maintain this kind of lie anymore. And then it's no big deal. People have affairs, they have children, they get divorced. You know, there's nothing uh, unusual about that. What was unusual was the keeping together for that five years, which meant for me, as a teenager, going from 11 to 16, with this kind of anger, anger and dislike and vituperative poison in the family. But I couldn't wait to get away, which is why ultimately I ran away once I knew I had my place in university in Cambridge and ran away to France. I think his dad was quite distant. I think he was brought up in a, in a pretty traditional, old-fashioned English home. And I think that that's really you know, you become an eccentric as a way of dealing with the kind of multi-layered, and that's what makes great myth makers. The other band members thought that the idea of a waltz album was a bit of a joke. 
He'd been saying about making an album of waltzes on stage as a way of introducing some of the waltzes we play in the set. I didn't think he was serious. What are you going to do with uh, one, two, three, one, two, three? What are you going to do with that? How would I feel if you wanted to waltz with some other guy with no dancing faults? I bury my heart and hide all my thoughts. So dance yourself, stupid. Save me the waltz. Me the waltz. What a kiss of death, doing an album of waltzes. Guaranteed loser. Good on you, Hank. I think it's great. You never know, people might get entranced by the waltz, but that's not the point of doing it. Again, the doing of things like that is because you want to do them for some reason or other. One of the reasons can be to make loads of money, but that's never been one of my reasons because I'm old enough and have not made the money to know that that isn't going to happen. Unless it does. Save me the waltz. 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 In fact, I'm thinking of making it a double album. Number jacks may be big and tough, and truckers even stronger, but they're nowhere. Big and tough, and truckers.